tell you right now, from the time the president gave his, his, his inaugurational address to his tweets this week, I don't see that much sacred honor. But what I do see from communities around this country, when there was a Muslim ban showing up, what I saw at Dulles Airport with people with yarmulkes and sitsas cheering Muslim families, calling off with hundreds of others cheering Muslim families as they came off the trains. I saw this in the Women's March. I saw this when they tried to rip away health care. I see this country standing up and saying, no, despair is not going to have the last word. And so what I want you to know today is this idea. Some might want to call it sacred honor. Some might want to call it patriotism. But I want to break it down further because patriotism is love of country. And you cannot love your country unless you love your country men and women. The Realizing we have it in the first place. 
Every action you take, every time you stand up for love, every time you resist, every time you contribute for love, it releases a force into the universe. I know this because when my family was moving to Harrington Park, New Jersey in 1969, they were denied housing because of the color of their skin. Every time they would show up at a house in the suburban neighborhoods, they would be told the house was sold, and they would leave, but they found this group of folk. These lawyers organized a sting operation with the Fair Housing Council, and they began to send white couples behind my parents to find out if the house was indeed still for sale. And indeed, my parents would look at the house, be told it was sold, the white couple would come find out the house was for sale. Amazing that my, my parents found this house they loved, they were told it was sold, the white couple came, it was still for sale, the white couple put a bid on the house, the bid was accepted, papers were drawn up, and on the day of the closing, the white couple didn't show up. My dad did in a volunteer lawyer. <laughs> and, and it was crazy because my dad walks in with the lawyer. The lawyer makes a speech. The, 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 the real estate agent gets upset. He stands up, doesn't capitulate. He punches my dad's lawyer in the face. He sticks a dog on my dad. And every time my dad would tell the story, the dog would get bigger. <laughs> So here I am. I grow up in that house after all this legal rigmarole. We get into the home. I grow up in this house, 18 years old. I go off to Stanford University, got into that university because of a 4.0, 1600, 4.0 yards per carry, 1600 receiving yards. Of a Back then I had a tight end now. And, and, and now I'm afraid to turn around. <laughs> I used to be chiseled, now I just jiggle. <laughs> <laughs> 10 years pass, 15 years pass, next thing you know, I'm a United States Senator, and I gotta write a book, because that's what senators do. <laughs> so I write my book, I have to fact check things. I do not want to have a, a moment uh, uh, like a certain uh, HUD secretary did when he was right, talking about his story, so I went to go find out, you know, how big the dog was. Was it a dog? <laughs> My father was eventually saying, son, it was a pack of wolves. I had to fight. <laughs> and so I find one of the lawyers who organized all the other lawyers, an average person who gave up time on Fridays and Saturdays just to help black families, a white guy. Why was this white man helping so many black families integrate his neighborhood? Well, sir, tell me the story. Confirm the facts and the details. I learned how big the dog actually really was. <laughs> But I wanted to know what was his motivation. And he says to me, I know the moment I made the decision, I was sitting down on my couch comfortable. There's injustice all over the country. It was the 60s, but he was on his couch comfortable. And he's watching TV. And he sees the news break in. And it's from Alabama. They're covering these marchers. They're marching from Selma to Montgomery for voting rights for African Americans in the South. And he's watching it, and to his disturbance, he sees these Alabama State Troopers with billy clubs flailing, with tear gas, march into this crowd and start beating his fellow Americans. He was so disturbed that he goes to his office the next day and says, Leo, to my partner, we gotta go to Alabama. Leo says, we, you can't go to Alabama. He laughs, not because it's funny, but it's just preposterous. They couldn't afford tickets. They, they were in a startup business. And they just sat there for a while and thought, and then eventually, in essence, they decided, you know what, why don't we just do the best we can with what we have where we are? And they started making phone calls around, and they found this woman named Miss Lee Porter, who was head of the Fair Housing Council in the 60s. She's still the head of the Fair Housing Council now, by the way. <laughs> I just sent a notice to her for her 92nd birthday commemoration. 92 years old, now she's not representing black families, she's representing same-sex couples. <laughs> and so, this is the point I want to make. Marchers on a bridge in the 60s, they had no idea that one day of standing up, one day of standing up for love would release that energy into the universe. It would instantaneously travel a thousand miles and change the heart of a man sitting on a couch in New Jersey who would then get up and go to work and change the outcome for generations not yet born. 
That is the power of love. 